Hello everyone, and thank you for coming. In most conferences, the call for paper closes a couple of months before the actual event. And that means that candidates usually have to face the challenge of coming up with an idea that will be both hot and fresh a couple of months from now. What I usually do is that I'm trying to come up with topics and ideas uh, that include things that are on the bleeding edge. And by bleeding edge, I mean that include features and stuff uh, that are often considered of uh, beta or even alpha quality. So I don't know why, but uh, I managed to always get myself into trouble. And uh, by that, I mean that a couple of weeks before the actual event, I find myself, instead of prepping for the actual presentation, to try and hunt bugs down and make things more robust and more presentable. So in this particular case, while I was doing uh, the traditional demonstration-driven development routine, I, I hit some issues, some uh, memory leak and connection leak issues, and I found myself in a pretty tight spot. Lucky for me, there were other people in the wider Jenkins community that were having similar issues with me, and we managed to collaborate, to work everyone together, and uh, nail the issues down. So I'm really, really grateful for the Jenkins community, and I really thank you all guys for being so present and so vibrant and all over the place on GitHub, on the mailing lists, in this conference. Thank you very much. Today I will be speaking about the triad of Jenkins, Kubernetes, and OpenShift. I will focus mostly on the Jenkins Kubernetes axis, but I will have references for OpenShift too. And wait a sec, who are you again? I'm glad you asked. My name is Yanis, and I'm a member at the Apache Software Foundation, where over the last couple of years, I had uh, the chance and the privilege to commit and contribute to a lot of cool and interesting projects, among other Apache Camel, JClouds, Curator, and more. Now, as part of my day job, I work as a principal software engineer at Red Hat. And the last couple of years, I've been uh, part of the Fabricate team. As part of the Fabricate team, our mission and vision was to make Kubernetes and OpenShift as accessible as possible to developers, mostly Java developers, but not only. So over the years, we created a lot of interesting stuff, like uh, clients, tooling, Maven tooling, testing frameworks, uh, a, C a CI CD solution on top of uh, Jenkins. Really, really cool and valuable stuff. The last uh, six to eight months, I moved to a new team which is called Synthesis, and Synthesis is all about delivering an integration platform as a service on top of OpenShift. Now, my role as part of the Synthesis team, among others, is to work on CI and CD. So the experiences gathered over the years as part of the Fabricate team and the Synthesis team is what I want to share with you here today. I intend to start by demonstrating how easy it is to get uh, Jenkins installed on top of, Je of uh, Kubernetes. And trust me, there's no better way on doing that than doing it live. So I will live code some uh, configuration files, some manifests for you to see. And then I'm going to start talking about plugins. I'm going to present uh, the most uh, relevant and, related and uh, useful plugins for you to use with uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. And I'm going to use those plugins in order to write some pipelines with you here today that will build your project, package your project, and deploy your project on your target environment. Then I'm going to deep dive into some more advanced topics. And finally, I'm going to share with you some hints and tips. And of course, in the end, I will do some Q&A. Now, I wouldn't count on uh, the Q&A in the end, mostly because uh, having live coding and things like that can uh, make, uh, the, you know, make it harder to finish the whole presentation in time. So at any point in time, feel free to raise your hands and I'll try to stop and uh, answer your question as best as I can as soon as I see you. So let's get started. How does one get started with installing Jenkins on top of Kubernetes? You actually need two things. The first one is Docker images and the second one is uh, Kubernetes manifests. Now for Docker images, luckily, Docker Hub is full of uh, images related to Jenkins. So I'm pretty sure you will be able to find uh, a Jenkins image and use it as a starting point for your own custom image. And I'm implying that you will have to create your own custom image, mostly because 
you will need to include in that image things like uh, the plugins of choice that you will be using, uh, maybe some initial configuration for those plugins, maybe even uh, the actual job definitions that you will be using. So for the needs of this presentation, I created my own image. I switched to my editor, and as you can see, that image starts with the Jenkins community image. I'm using the Alpine variation. And the first thing that I'm doing is I'm disabling the setup wizard. Then I'm installing uh, the Docker binaries. I'm defining which are the plugins that I'm going to use. And in the end, I'm creating an empty pipeline job definition that I will use in order to host the pipeline live coding that we'll be doing here today. I can build that image directly from within my editor, and once the image is done and is built, I'm able to jump in and uh, create my own set of manifests. I'm creating an empty uh, YAML file that I will call uh, demo. And the first thing that I'm be using is an empty Kubernetes list in which I'm going to add a service account that I'll call Jenkins. And this is the service account that our deployment will use. The deployment will be also called Jenkins and it will use the Docker image we just built. It will also use the service account that we defined and in uh, the deployment we just defined, we need to specify the container ports that we are be, will be using. Apparently, I will be needing a port 8080 for HTTP, which is the port that uh, we are going to use in order to access the Jenkins dashboard. And the second port will be the agent port, which is 50,000. And this is the port where Jenkins agents are going to use in order to connect to the master. Now, I'm also going to define a couple of volumes. The first one will be a host path volume, which uh, I'll use for the Jenkins workspace. And uh, I'm going to select the path, Jenkins home workspace. Okay, that's cool. And since I'll be using uh, Docker, I'll also create a volume for the Docker socket. Oops. Now, for each of those two volumes, I will mount them in my pod. First, the Jenkins workspace and uh, I'll mount it under var Jenkins home workspace. And then the Docker socket, which will be mounted under var run Docker sock. Okay, there we are. Now, the only thing that uh, is left to be done is to define a service for my deployment. And I'm going to define a node port service, which will be called Jenkins, and will refer the two container ports we created, the HTTP, and also the agent port. Which is from port 50,000, targeting to port 50,000. Okay, if I haven't done any kind of typo or any kind of uh, other mistake, I should be able to directly uh, install this manifest on my Kubernetes cluster. Uh, for this presentation, I'm using Minikube. Minikube is running directly on my laptop, so this is where I'm going to install uh, the manifest we just created. Okay, I just managed to create the Jenkins service account, the Jenkins deployment, and the Jenkins service. And if I switch to my browser and have a look on my dashboard, I have a Jenkins deployment already running. 
And I should be able to access uh, Jenkins directly from my browser. Yep, there it is. And it currently just creates the empty job that I mentioned before, which are going to, we are going to use uh, to host our pipelines. Make sense so far? See how easy it is? So let's get back to the slides. At this point, we should decide which is the strategy that we are going to use for scaling Jenkins. And uh, for scaling Jenkins uses the notion of agents. And the agents are processes that are able to accept uh, work from uh, Jenkins master so that it can offload some of uh, you know, its load. Usually there are two ways of uh, dealing with, ag with agents. And the first one is the on-demand where Jenkins uses uh, the notion of a cloud and it requests from that cloud the creation of something like a virtual machine or a container that will host the agent process. The other approach is the ad hoc where the user himself creates those processes and decides where those processes are going to run. And those processes communicate with the Jenkins master and let the Jenkins master know that they are there and they can uh, accept some of the load. Now, for the on-demand approach, in Kubernetes, you can use the Kubernetes plugin, which defines the Kubernetes cloud and is able to create Kubernetes pods that host the agent process. For the ad hoc approach, you can use something like uh, the Jenkins Swarm plugin, but I find that uh, I prefer to use the on-demand and the Kubernetes plugin approach pretty much all the time, mostly because it requires no further uh, effort from the user side. I don't want to get into more details about uh, scaling Jenkins, mostly because Carlos Sanchez is going to cover this uh, topic tomorrow. He will be talking uh, explicitly about scaling Jenkins on uh, Kubernetes using the Kubernetes plugin. So I'll move to, to other stuff. We've installed Jenkins. We've decided how we are going to use and uh, scale Jenkins. And now we are able to create and define our jobs and start working on our pipelines. Now, each job that you are going to create is going to have different requirements and it's possibly going to have uh, requirements on different tools, different versions of tools. So for example, you may have jobs that use uh, Maven, other jobs may use uh, Golang, or they may use different versions of those tools, Maven 3.2.1, 3.5.0, whatever. So who is responsible for configuring all those tools and how you can do that without duplicating the whole configuration and have uh, the configuration both in the project and Jenkins, how you avoid this duplication. An approach that it has been popularized the last couple of years, mostly by the Docker pipeline plugin, is to use containers. And according to this approach, you package all the build tools and the configuration you want for your builds inside containers and you reference those containers from within your pipelines. Now, since we are talking about containers, the major pro of this approach is that it is quite reproducible, it is surprise free. And since Docker Pipeline provides a DSL that it is really, really easy to use, it's really, really easy to use, right? <laughs> the question is, can I use the Docker Pipeline plugin from within Kubernetes? The short answer is yes, you can. And I will show you an example. For the sake of this example and this presentation, I created a simple project. It is a Golang project, which is called Hello Go. And guess what? It provides an HTTP server that when you hit that, it responds with Hello World. It's a really original concept. I just started it a couple of weeks prior to the event. Now, it's a single file. I can build it. Uh, with a build script like that. And once I build it and get my hands uh, on the binary output, I can package everything using uh, Docker with a Docker file like this. It takes the output of the build, package it inside a, a container, and uh, you can just run that container and get uh, the hello server running. And of course, the project includes a manifest, which is pretty similar to the manifest we handcrafted a few minutes ago for Jenkins itself. 
Now, I can check out the source of this project and uh, create a pipeline directly from within my editor. And this is what uh, we are going to do. I've actually already checked out the project. It's under the Hello Go folder. And I can create a file named pipeline.groovy. Now inside that pipeline, I can create a simple Docker pipeline that defines a container that is going to use the Golang image to satisfy the needs of our build. And we'll check out the source from my GitHub repository. The project is hello go. And inside that container, it will do a Golang build. Sorry. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. I'm actually terrible at typing and I do so many mistakes that uh, I even had to create an alias for my nickname itself. <laughs> no, 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 it's true story. So, and, uh, oops. From within the editor, I can upload the job on Jenkins. And as you can see, I, I started build with uh, number one, the build uh, has started and uh, it just finished. I think that it's something wrong. I, I should expect a more rich output. Uh, let me switch to the browser. Let me try again, sorry for that. Okay, now it's better. I think that I forgot to save my file. So this time we can see that uh, the pipeline is executed. It checks out the source from Git and then it executes the command for building the application and everything is successful and it, it's running. Now back to the slides. To use the Docker pipeline plugin within Kubernetes, I had to do two things. The first one was to include the Docker binaries within my image. And the second was to mount the Docker socket again inside my Jenkins pod. These are also two of the major cons of this approach, right? You have to use uh, the Docker binaries and you have to have access to the Docker socket. In most Kubernetes environments, this won't be a problem. It's not a problem for me here that I'm using Minisys. It won't be a problem for you. It won't be a problem even if you, if you use a Google uh, container engine and things like that. But in more restrictive flavors of Kubernetes and uh, in Kubernetes, you may have issues. And uh, when I say more restrictive uh, flavors, I'm referring to OpenShift. In most OpenShift-based uh, distributions, you won't be able to use host path mounts. And uh, it's possible that uh, you won't be able to talk directly to the Docker socket in the manner that I just demonstrated. And of course, another con of this approach is that since it's something specific to Docker, you can't use Kubernetes-specific resources. For example, you can't use config maps, you can't use secrets, which are stuff that uh, in many cases are really useful to use in your builds. For example, uh, I find myself liking mounting my settings XML for Maven builds as a secret within my build container. And this is something that you can't do uh, with the Docker pipeline plugin. So at some point, we thought that it should be a really good idea if we port it all the concepts of the Docker pipeline plugin into a new kind of plugin, which is called Kubernetes pipeline plugin, that instead of creating uh, directly a Docker container by speaking to the Docker daemon, it could create a Kubernetes pod by talking to the Kubernetes API master. The main pro of this approach would be that it could use Kubernetes specific resources. It could use uh, Kubernetes volumes, config maps, secrets, things like that. The major con 
is that for this approach to work, there should be some sort of sharing file system. And to be more specific, the agent that will execute the job has to share file system with the actual build container. And again, this may mean host path mounts or some other kind of uh, volume for sharing file system between containers. So to eliminate the sharing file system requirements, a year ago, we came up with a very nice idea. And that idea was to modify the Kubernetes plugin and add support for multi-container pods. With this approach, we collocate the actual agent container with our build container, and containers of the same pod do get sharing file system for free. So with this approach, you can create pods that are able to execute pipelines, and they can run pretty much everywhere. They can run on Kubernetes, they can run on OpenShift, they can run anywhere. Also, on top of uh, the updated Kubernetes plugin, we added some limited pipeline capabilities so that the user is a, can be able to define how those pods, how those pod templates will look like. Here's an example. And it should read somehow like this. Create a pod template named my pod and add a label on top of it named provides go. Then inside that template, I want you to package not only the agent container, but I want you to package a Golang container named Golang, which uses the Golang image. And then I want you to create a node that uses the label provides go. And when that node is created, I want you to find a container named Golang inside it, and then check out the source and run the command that I want you. This is nice, this works nice, but it is a little bit more verbose than the approach I demonstrated earlier. And also it's not, it's not as intuitive. So a couple of months ago, we had the idea of rewriting the Kubernetes pipeline plugin, only this time on top of the updated Kubernetes plugin. This way we can have the best of both worlds. So for example, we have the multi-container pod concept that eliminates the sharing file system requirements, but we also have a pretty neat DSL that hides uh, the complexity and the implementation details of the Kubernetes plugin. The major con of this approach, it is something really, really new. I think that um, the first official release of the Kubernetes pipeline plugin that support this concept uh, was last week. So it's highly experimental and that's why I'd like to show you how it works. I'm switching back to my editor and uh, I will delete the Docker pipeline stuff we created. And this time I'm going to create, um, sorry. I'm going to create a Kubernetes pipeline. This time, instead of creating a Docker container, I'm defining a Kubernetes pod with the Golang image that will check out the project from GitHub and run the build for me. Okay, I'll save twice this time. Okay, and build number three is running. And as you can see, behind the scenes, it defines a pod template for us. It defines the node exactly as we would do ourselves if we were using the Kubernetes plugin. And again, it defines a container. It checks out the source from Git. It will execute the cell command and yada, yada, yada. Okay, is this the whole functionality that the Kubernetes pipeline pro plugin provides? No, it also provides uh, pipeline steps for working with Docker. So you can use the Kubernetes pipeline plugin to run uh, your Docker builds, to tag your images, to push your images to registries and things like that. The main difference from this approach to the traditional Docker pipeline approach is that it talks to the Docker daemon directly using uh, the API and does not rely on the existence of the Docker uh, CLI binaries 
inside your images. So it gives you more flexibility. I can modify the pipeline we just created and uh, add a Docker build inside it. And it should be as simple as that. Kubernetes image build, IO kernel, uh, hello, go. But in order for our build pods to be able to talk to the Docker daemon, we need access to the Docker socket. So it's not enough that uh, Jenkins master can talk to the Docker socket. The build bot itself needs to talk to the Docker socket. So I'm mounting the Docker socket again from host. And of course, uh, our container needs to be privileged. I'm crossing my fingers. Build number four is started. Sorry? The with host paths means that uh, the pod that we just defined will use a host path mount and uh, it will mount uh, that particular path from the host. Oh. Uh, yep, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and, and that's why it failed because uh, we have the typo and uh, we are going to run the job again. Thank you for spotting that. Now, while we wait for the build to, to complete, I'd like to share a few de details of how this will work inside uh, OpenShift. Inside OpenShift, it's generally not suggested to try with any kind of way to talk to the Docker daemon. OpenShift has the notion of uh, builds, and it is suggested when you are working with OpenShift to use builds and build configuration in order to create your images. So instead of talking to the Docker daemon and uh, requesting a Docker build, you could create a build configuration and request a Docker build. OpenShift provides a Jenkins plugin, which is called uh, Jenkins OpenShift uh, plugin, if I remember correctly, which uh, among others, provides a lot of uh, pipeline steps that you can use in order to interact with OpenShift. So you can use those pipeline steps and request uh, from OpenShift to start a new build. And this is how this concept is uh, translated to OpenShift. Okay, as you can see, uh, this time after our Golang build, the Docker build ran and it ran uh, successfully. And I can move back to my slides. So, we started with installing Jenkins on Kubernetes. We talked about scaling. We create a few simple pipelines with the Docker plugin, with the Kubernetes pipeline plugin. And now we could use uh, the experience we've gained so far in order to move our application from our dev environment to our staging environment or to production. Remember, we were able to package our application into containers and our end goal is to move those containers to our, target, to our target environment. Of course, before we do that, we also need to make sure that the changes that uh, we are going to move to production are valid. We need to make sure that we won't break the world. So we need to test things. And testing things indiv individually and in isolation is good. But when you have uh, something that's not just a monolith and is composed of multiple different services and multiple different modules, you have to test the whole thing. You have to test things end to end. And in Kubernetes and OpenShift, this means that you have to create an environment, possibly an ephemeral environment, install all your services inside that environment, and then kick your tests. Now, if you are a Java user, you may be familiar with a testing framework called Archelian. Archelian was a really, really popular framework for testing JE applications. And now with the whole container evolution, it created a new uh, sub-project called Archelian Cube for testing containerized applications. 
The last year, Archelium Cube obtained two new modules, one for Kubernetes and one for OpenShift. And those two modules simplify integration testing on Kubernetes by generating and maintaining an ephemeral environment where you can install your application, all your services. Those two modules will make sure that uh, everything is up and running, that uh, the readiness probes uh, pass, that the liveness probes pass. And once everything is up and running, it will then bootstrap your tests. Remember, there is no point in starting your test suite if your environment is not valid or is not in a ready state. Once everything is done, it will perform a cleanup so that you don't leave anything behind and pollute the environment. Archelian Cube really, really rocks and it's really, really useful in Kubernetes and OpenShift. And I'm not just saying that because I'm actively involved in the project, but I'm just saying that because I believe so. But it has some major limitations. And the major limitation is that it's written in Java and it's targeting Java developers. So I find it very unlikely for Python developers or Golang developers to want to use Archelian because that would mean that they would have to run the actual end-to-end -end tests in Java. So even though you can test uh, with Archelian applications in whatever framework and in whatever language, the, the tests themselves would have to be written in Java. And that can be a problem for many teams, and it was actually a problem for our team, and I'm referring to synthesis. And uh, that was a problem because our QE engineers decided to write the integration tests using Protractor, which is a JavaScript-based end-to-end testing framework. And that meant that we could not use Archelian. So instead of firing the QA engineers and rewrite everything in Java, we decided that we, it would be a better idea if we could uh, wrap the Archelian cube itself within a Jenkins plugin so that we can have pipeline steps that provide the Archelian cube functionality from within our pipelines. So we created steps that help you manage the whole ephemeral namespace concept. We created uh, steps that do create the environment for you, make sure that the environment is ready, and things like that. And of course, do they clean up things that I already mentioned? Why don't I show you how you can use those steps from within your pipeline? I'm back to my pipeline.groovy file, and I can use the in namespace block and define that I want the creation of an ephemeral namespace that will be prefixed with test ns. Now, everything within the in namespace block is going to be executed inside the ephemeral namespace. And I'm using the create environment step in order to define that I want the kubernetes.yaml that was present on my GitHub uh, repository and checked out inside my workspace, that I want to install that descriptor inside the ephemeral namespace I created. This will wait until the namespace is ready. And at this point, I could execute and bootstrap my end-to-end -end tests. And when everything is done and everything is successful, I could reuse the in namespace approach. Only this time, I could define a fixed namespace. And for the sake of this demonstration, I will install everything inside the Jenkins conf namespace, which is the namespace that I use to host uh, Jenkins. See any typos there? No, okay. We're running build number six. And if everything goes well, we should be able to access the Hello Go application running inside our Jenkins workspace. While we are waiting for our pipeline to complete its execution, I'd like to say uh, a few things about OpenShift. Inside OpenShift, we could use the whole, the in namespace and create environment combination in order to 
run our end-to-end -end tests. But when we decide that we want to roll out those changes to our staging environment or our production environment, we could use a capability provided by deployment configs of uh, OpenShift. And uh, with that capability, we are able to roll out and trigger a new development, a new deployment wherever a new tag is uh, present on that project. So instead of doing the in namespace uh, at Jenkins Cove created the environment, we could use the OpenShift pipeline plugin and uh, just tag the image we created in the previous steps inside the Jenkins Conf project. Okay, everything uh, seems to be successful. And if I go a little bit higher in the log, we can see that we now have the hello go pod running. And I could use my Minikube service command in order to access hello go from within my browser. And this is it. Hello, hello world. There are a ton of different ways for you to handle your deployments. We demonstrated the create environment. Uh, I mentioned uh, an OpenShift variant for installing uh, Kubernetes descriptors. You can also do it manually using the CLI, but I strongly uh, suggest to use the create environment, mostly because you get the whole readiness thing for free, and you also get very rich uh, debugging information if things go south. For example, if for any reason the resources that you installed failed to start properly, either because uh, there's some sort of error with the pod or uh, the readiness probe uh, fails, it will go and find the containers that are related to the failed deployment and will retrieve all the events from uh, Kubernetes associated with that pod and also it will uh, retrieve the logs and will display them for you. So you will have everything and uh, all the troubleshooting information that you, that you need in one place. And this is why I prefer the create environment approach. Time for some tips. In many cases, you will want to use credentials. And the proper way to use credentials within uh, Kubernetes is to mount uh, the sensitive information as part of a secret. And once you mount the secret, you can use a groovy script, like the one shown in your script, to read the secret from the path that it is mounted, and then create a user password credential or a string credential and add it to your credential store. Why we suggest this approach? The answer is that we don't want to include sensitive information directly in our image. We don't want to pass sensitive information as part of environment variables. We don't want to do any of that. So we mount the secrets, and then we use a groovy script to install the secrets to our Jenkins master. I was lucky enough in, uh, in the demonstration so far that everything worked pretty much smoothly. We had a couple of typos, but OK, nothing <laughs> worse than that. In real life, you will often have to deal with failures, and you will have to eventually troubleshoot. You may have some sort of misconfiguration in your Docker image. You may have uh, some nasty typo in your Kubernetes descriptors. And when we are talking about troubleshooting things on Kubernetes, that means that we often have to go and uh, check the logs of our pods. We have to check the events of our pods and sometimes even execute inside those pods in order to retrieve further debugging information. So this means that just using the console output of Jenkins is not enough. And that also means that many times we have to go to the console, retrieve the generated pod name, and then go back to our cell and do the Kubernetes magic in order to retrieve all those kind of information. A trick that I find really, really useful is to include the job name and the build number inside the label that I'm adding in my pod template. And this way, since uh, Kubernetes plugin 0.12, we get a pod named after that label. So that means that when you look at the pod name, you know exactly which is the job and which is the build number it refers to. So by correlating jobs with, with pods, you make your life so much easier. And of course, when you move to more complex uh, 
projects and uh, more complex requirements, you may have to combine build tools together. So for example, in this uh, case, I needed to have a container to use for my builds that would include both Maven and the OpenShift CLI binaries. So what should I do? Should I create a new Docker image that would package Maven with OpenShift together? That would be one approach, but if I had to go this way every time I needed to combine tools, that would result in me tackling a lot of different images and that would uh, create pretty much a Docker image hell that I would like to avoid. So I kind of preferring composition versus inheritance every time, at least whenever it's possible. And we are lucky enough that the Kubernetes plugin allow us to package multiple containers within a single pod, and that means we can package multiple build tools within a single pod. And then when the pod start, we are able to share tools among different containers. In this example, when the pod starts, we are going inside the OpenShift container and we copy the OpenShift binary from where it's initially installed to a third place, which is the workspace, which is accessible through the home and variable. Then in the Maven container, I'm able to perform the Maven build and then just refer to the OEC binary directly from within my workspace. This is something uh, that we've used a lot in the Synthesis project and it is really, really useful. So whenever you can, know that you can choose this approach. I think that it should be clear by now that you start with simple pipelines, but as requirements change and uh, things get more complex, the pipelines become longer and longer and maybe more complex and harder to maintain. Lucky for us, Jenkins provides uh, the notion and the concept of pipeline libraries. And what is a pipeline library? Pipeline libraries is a repository that contains reusable groovy functions that contain pieces that we can use uh, between our pipelines. This way, you promote the readability of your pipelines because you are actually reusing the libraries pretty much the same way that you would do in any traditional language. You promote reusability because those pieces are reusable. And it also allows you to keep your actual pipelines as dry as possible because you hide all the implementation details is inside the groovy function and inside your Jenkins file, you keep just uh, a reference to your functions. And this is really, really useful. I would like to close with an advice that it is not just for Kubernetes and OpenShift environments, but it is more general. I think that nowadays, being able to validate your code changes and being able to move things to production as fast as possible is, is or should be considered a non-functional requirement. So the whole CI CD infrastructure is not yet another op tool. It's actually as important to your whole application as is your database, as is your web server, as is anything. And you really should treat it like that. So you should be able at any point of time to recreate the whole CI and CD infrastructure and it should be done in a way that it is reproducible and it is free of surprises. So I strongly advise you to use source control for everything, use source control for your images, use source control for manifest, scripts, configuration, job definitions, everything. If you are using pipelines, it's a good idea to collocate the pipelines with the project so that you can keep everything in one place. And of course, everything needs to be as reproducible as possible. So I urge you to avoid using Maven snapshots and latest tags, at least to the degree that it is possible. Unfortunately, I had the case to witness, uh, I had the chance to witness cases where teams were not able to deliver that. They were not able to reproducibly recreate the whole environment in an instant. And after an upgrade gone bad, they were left crippled and they were unable to use CI and CD for a couple of days. And that meant they couldn't validate their code changes and they couldn't roll out uh, new features to production. So this is something that you definitely don't want to happen to your team. And it is something that uh, 
you should avoid at any cost. So what I'm saying is love your CI CD as you love your whole application. Some resources that I'd like to share with you. All the examples and all the code that uh, we wrote today as part of this presentation is going to be uploaded to my GitHub account under the presentations project. I will have a special branch just for this presentation. You will find everything there. Links to the plugins that I mentioned and demonstrated in this presentation. Kubernetes plugin, the Kubernetes pipeline plugin, and of course the OpenShift Jenkins plugin, which I mostly talked about. And of course, two pipeline libraries that heavily use Kubernetes and OpenShift, and you can draw ideas from that or you can even reuse them as is. The first one is the Fabricate Pipeline Library, which is used in the Fabricate CI CD solution. And the other is the Synthesis Pipeline Library. You could consider the Synthesis Pipeline Library uh, as a small subset of the Fabricate, which is more focused on OpenShift. You can get a lot of uh, interesting ideas there. Some people that are really, really influential in the space, and uh, it's a good idea to follow. First one is uh, Carlos Sanchez. He's the main contributor of the Kubernetes uh, plugin. He will be talking tomorrow about scaling Jenkins on Kubernetes. Make sure you check out this presentation. Second one, James Strachan. He's uh, mostly responsible for Fabricate CICD. I don't think that I need to say anything more about James. And also James Rowling, uh, co-responsible for the Fabricate CICD goodness. He is also known as DevOps Jesus. And it, he's really, really awesome with uh, pipelines. I, I think he can talk pipelines, actually. And uh, before we get to questions and answers, uh, I would like to say that uh, please use the Jenkins app on iOS or Android to read this presentation. Uh, I would be grateful. So time to hear your questions. Yes, please. Yes, it's Pacemax. It's uh, an Emacs distribution. Uh, and I used it mostly because um, I was, I, it allowed me to interact with Jenkins and uh, Docker so I didn't have to pop out from window to window. With, with lots of aliases? Yeah, exa exactly. I, I don't know, if, if you want, I can uh, serve them as part of this presentation too. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, if, I, I, I will. Sorry? Which cloud platform has good support for Kubernetes? Is it Google or AWS? Or? I, I think that you can, uh, nowadays you, you can have uh, Kubernetes uh, everywhere. Uh, you can use the, uh, the Google container engine. You can uh, use Kubernetes on top of uh, AWS. You can use uh, OpenShift online. Yes, please. So going back to the slides that we have, the pod template creation and filter. Okay. Uh, can, where, where do we see the request response payload stuff if you want to try out like if my Kubernetes cluster is rejecting my pod template creation or anything like that? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yes, uh, those are uh, information that you will usually have to configure inside the... Yeah, can you repeat that question so the audience can hear it? And, okay. And also record, thank you. So the question is um, how do I debug cases where Kubernetes might reject the creation of my pod template. And the answer is that for most of the Kubernetes stuff, configuration of timeouts and things like that, you do that uh, from within the, the Kubernetes console. In the bottom, you will find the Kubernetes, um, the Kubernetes cloud that defines pretty much everything, timeouts, uh, container capacities and things like that. And if for any reason you have any sort of failure, I usually check uh, the log of, uh, of Jenkins. The first stop is to check the Jenkins log. And the second is to check what happens in uh, the namespace that hosts my Jenkins installation. So many times and the most common uh, failure cases would be either to be some sort of problem with the image. So for example, an image that can be downloaded or a container that is failing to start. And in all those cases, the result would be to have a pod 
in failing state. And if you go and describe the pod that is in failing state, you will soon be able to realize what's wrong with that. So while I was rehearsing, I often had cases where I made a typo on the image name and uh, Kubernetes was not able to, to find the image. But when I went to the pod description, I could see that the failure is that the image cannot be retrieved. Or if uh, a script or the command that we send to the pod is wrong, we can see that there too. So usually first stop is Jenkins log, second stop is um, the namespace. Yes, I think I think that the, this would be really really helpful, and this is what we did in uh, in the Archelian lab where we had similar issues. And I really think that we should uh, use the same concept inside uh, the Kubernetes plugin so that we can make life of the developers easier to troubleshoot. Great. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, yes, you can. Uh, you can pretty much use any kind of volume you want. So you can specify the volumes as part of your pod templates and the rest is up to you. So uh, the question was uh, if we are able to use uh, build containers that uh, mount uh, long uh, link volumes. That was a question, right? Yeah, and the answer is yes. You can use any kind of volume supported by Kubernetes inside your pod template and b benefit from that. Yes, please. In one of the slides, I did recollect seeing that, like, is there a feature available in the, the plugin or anything that, so that I can do like the exit into the pod or like, or have the pod, like let's say if I have a build failure and then I'm seeing the build failure, I just want to see, make sure that the, the pod itself is around. It's not an ephemeral, it doesn't die immediately after the build is done. Is there any way I can kind of like, yeah, specify that, hey, stick around so that I can access, troubleshoot my workspace or anything related to the build? So, if, so the question is, uh, if there is a way for me to keep uh, a failing container, a failing pod around for troubleshooting purposes? And uh, the answer is that I, I think not. Uh, it's an interesting concept that we could possibly add, but I think that at the moment it's not possible. Yes, please. Is there a mechanism in this plugin to deploy to other Kubernetes clusters? You mean not local, a remote Kubernetes cluster? Let's say as one cluster for my building, but my production clusters are elsewhere? Yes, uh, it's absolutely possible. I've seen cases where people were targeting OpenShift, and OpenShift can be really, really restrictive in what it allows you to do and uh, what not. And I've seen uh, people using uh, or installing Jenkins outside of OpenShift just to, to avoid that and just use uh, a reference to the OpenShift uh, API master so that they can just create the build pod or run jobs there. You can also run even your build pods outside of uh, Kubernetes or outside of OpenShift and just use uh, OpenShift as a target deployment platform. The service account credentials mm -hmm. are provided, yeah. and then so the authentication is less. But if it is like an external cluster, then the, the cloud configuration, right, the authentication, will have to be provided, right? It's different. Yes. So, how you configure the Kubernetes plugin? In my screen, mm -hmm. you can see that we have uh, and that we specify the URL to our Kubernetes cluster. And uh, right underneath, you can specify things uh, like um, a, a certificate key and, and things like that, for, and credentials. Uh, so this way, you can uh, communicate and access remote clusters if you want. So it's it's really up, up to you. What, but what about the service accounts? If they want to use the 
Like yes. Then how would I do that? The, the pipeline step for defining a pod template also allows you to define a service account. Let me, let me share an example with you. I think that this should be it. Yes. Uh, so this is an example uh, drawn directly from uh, the Synthesis project. We, we have created a pipeline library for simplifying things, but as you can see, uh, we have a step called with Maven that wraps around the pod template that defines a Maven uh, build pod. And we pass to that build pod the actual service account that we want uh, the build pods to use. And we can do all kinds of things, right? In this example, we are also, also passing a reference to a Maven uh, settings XML secret and things like that. But uh, you can, what I want to do point out is that you can use the pod template uh, step in order to configure pretty much anything from NVARs, uh, volumes, service account, uh, that they, which containers will be privileged and what not, you can specify anything. Other questions? Yes? Uh, can, uh, can we get a, a microphone so that I can better hear the answer, the, the question? Brilliant. Is there any way to get the, I'm looking at Jenkins, I'm looking at all this cool stuff that's going on. Is there any way to get Jenkins to actually start up a full cluster in somewhere like AWS so I can run my test, then destroy it afterwards? The whole cluster? Yeah, because I want a full stack. I want everything that's normally available in my production environment just scaled down. Well, something like, I, I'm not sure, I don't, the answer, the quick answer is that I don't know. Uh, if it can, it's definitely out of the scope of uh, this presentation. But uh, if you want to install the, the whole stack, you can usually just create a new namespace or a new project and install everything there. But if you want to also install the Kubernetes itself, I don't know, maybe if you use something like um, another uh, cloud-related plugin, maybe you could, but I'm really not sure. Are we done? Uh, are there any more questions? Okay, thank you so much.